Man, what a beautiful morning it is. Some of y'all even got to church on time. I'll give you an extra hour every morning, amen? amen? Praise the Lord, it is good to see you today, and what a great blessing and privilege to be able to get together with God's people and have church and worship the Lord together and get in the Word together, amen? Open your Bible with me as we continue our study in Philippians chapter 4. It's the second part of chapter 4 that we're looking at this week. We've talked about uh, this uh, letter for six weeks so far. This is our seventh lesson on this. We really, uh, as I've shared in the past, could have done about 14 to 20 lessons on it because there's just so much in here. Again, it's uh, what I stated at one point. It's, it's probably the main book in the Bible that you see most of the verses come from that are in little devotion books or on coffee cups and keychains from everything, you know, to live as Christ or my God shall supply your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I mean, one verse after another, every chapter has some of those what's called devotion verses in it that you see so many people are write devotional books on or just put on uh, items just as reminders in, in the Christian marketing world. But uh, it is a great book. I mean, it's a great letter from, from, from the Lord. And it's not just the apostle writing to the church of Philippi. It's the Lord writing to his church in general and speaking a word to us. So we're going to look at this today. And there's about three points that we're going to make out of this. And I'll, I'll go over those with you in just a moment. But the glory and the beauty of it is, is that there is this life that God has called us to live, extraordinary living. And that's where we're at, and that's what we're talking about. It's this life where you can have victory in Christ that's a reality, and it's not just Bible verse on a coffee cup. It's reality. It's not a bumper sticker. It's truth that we can live a unique kind of life that's different than the rest of the world knows or understands. It's a life of fullness. It's a life of contentment. It's a life of great satisfaction, and it is a life of peace. I didn't say it's a life without conflict, nor trouble, or peril because we all face those things. But in the midst of all that goes on, and that's the, the ringing part of chapter one, is that in the midst of everything that's going on, you can still be rejoicing and praising the Lord. So as we get in this, let's look at uh, verses today. As we look at this, verse, chapter four, verses 10 through 19. Let's see if this thing is working. I'll see if I can back it up first, back it forward. Hey, there it goes. Now back it up to the other verse for me, would you? All right. <laughs> Just making sure it's working. You asked me to check it. That was my check. So go back to the other verse. Thank you, sir. Verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. There he goes again. He's been rejoicing the whole letter. That now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked the opportunity. Now, not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Then comes this great passage that so many people don't realize the context of about this contentment and this satisfied life. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek a gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I have received everything in full. I have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you've sent a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by or in Christ Jesus. What a great, what a great passage of scripture. I've seen so many Christians claim that verse as well as that other verse about I can do all things through Christ. But there, those verses usually are claimed outside the context of what the scripture is. And yeah, the principles are applicable. You can apply those principles to many different situations. But you know, as always we say in Bible study, it's context, context, context. In the context of those great verses there, uh, the fact that here's some people responding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in regards to giving. Now, when I first started this series, I said there were two things about the church of Philippi that this letter was dealing with, two issues. And I didn't tell you what the second one was. I just started with the first one. First one, was chapters one through four, verse six or nine, or right through in there. 
And it was, it was dealing with a letter of encouragement. Here were some people that he deeply loved, deeply appreciated, deeply cared for, and he's expressing that along with a great deal of, 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 of encouragement and a love, his concern and his care for them. So he shares all that, deals with that's the first part of the letter. The second part of the letter is this, this part we just read through the end of the chapter. The first part was, a, was, was a, I love you, and it was an expression of love. The second little portion here is an expression of gratitude. First part says, I love you. Second part says, here's your giving receipt. You gave, but nobody else gave. You continued it. Even while I wasn't even there, you were sending money to me. You were seeing that my needs were met. And now he's thanking them rather vociferously about the great blessing that they have been to him. So these are the, the two elements. In fact, in this part of the letter, there's three things I really want us to catch from this, this part of the, the, the book of Philippians. Three main lessons. The lesson of concern is number one, the lesson of contentment, and then the lesson of contribution. And how all this works and how Paul gives us a, a great, great closing word to the church at Philippi, which is a great word for any church in any age, any day or time. So let's look at the first of it where he's talking about his, his, uh, this, this lesson of concern. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. You were concerned, there it is again, before, but you lacked the opportunity. Now this is a church that gets it, all right? They realize that ministry takes someone doing something for the glory of God. And that that someone in this position, the apostle Paul, as this missionary, needs to be sustained and helped and aided. And, and, and he's thanking them for their concern about him. I love, love the way he put it. He says, I thank the Lord that you've revived your concern. He said, not that you weren't concerned before. And what he's talking about here is that they're, they're, apparently they had tried to show their concern by a gift to him and couldn't get it there. So they lacked the opportunity, the, whether it was somebody to deliver it or finding out where he was in the moment of time, it didn't come. But he was aware that there had been a commitment. And now they're trying again. He says, you've revived that concern and you're continuing to, to, to show your compassion to me. What, what is the passage over in 1 John where it talks about how can we, when we have the world's goods, we behold a brother in need and, 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 and we don't share what his, to meet his need. Little children, we shouldn't just love in word you know, and in tongue, but we should learn, learn to love in deed and in truth. In other words, he, he's saying here, you, you say you have love for me and you expressed your love for me. It, it's the old, you put your money where your mouth is. You know, you, you showed compassion and you showed concern and you have continued to show that concern. It, it, they just didn't do it and quit. They kept on giving and they kept being a part of what was going on. And, and he, he's expressing this to them saying, thank God for you. And especially thank God because you did what so many others didn't do. You got it. Now I, I understand that when they saw the need, they responded to the need. Now it doesn't mean that as Christians and we have God's blessed us that every need that we should respond to, you know, uh, I remember uh, raising my kids and every once in a while we'd stop at a street corner, be somebody with a sign. Maybe I'd give something or maybe I wouldn't. And, and I think it was Cherry said, Dad, why, why'd you give to them and not give to them? I said, because, you know, it's, it's a matter of when you feel the Lord speak to you about it. You know, when, you, when the Lord says something, then you do it. It doesn't matter what the little sign says, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if they're a professional bum or not. All right. Just matter. Just God tells me to do something. The rest of that's God's business. That's in God's hands. He said, what if you have somebody go spend on beer? That's their problem. Amen. That's their issue. My issue is just obedience to walk in the light. And if God prompts my heart with a specific need, then I certainly need to be obedient to do what the Lord has told me to do and to respond and to show compassion and to show concern. We're living in a culture that has been extremely blessed, all right? Even the poorest of us in this church, in comparison to the rest of the world, you are extremely blessed. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, and some of you have been to some of these third world countries and mission trips with us. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. But lesson one, he says, I, I thank the Lord that you showed this concern for me. And he said, you know, that, that you cared about it. Now, the next part he goes to is this lesson of contentment. He talks about in verses 11 through 13, where he talks about, you know, I've learned how to get along with humble means. I know how to live, you know, in prosperity uh, and, uh, and I know how to live in poverty, but I've learned the, the, the secret of being filled and I've learned the secret of being hungry. I've learned the secret 
of having abundance, and I've also learned the secrets of suffering need. Now, first and foremost, that kind of ought to give you a clear picture that as Christians, it doesn't mean that we're going to always have everything perfect, right? There's going to be times of difficulty. There's going to be times of, of lack in our life. But he's discovered a secret that carries him through all that. There's this lesson of contentment. And if there's a lesson that has certainly been lost in the church, especially in the Western Hemisphere, it is this lesson of, of contentment. I remember reading out to one of those statements says, I don't know why Americans are the only people in the world that spend money they don't have for things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> that, that's America for you. You say, well, Brother Joe, you know, I, I, I'm more interested in the prosperity part he's talking about than in the suffering need part about it. So why didn't God just bless me, as some preachers would preach, with prosperity at all times, all right? And why doesn't he just do that? Because God is more interested in your character, all right, than your comfort. And too often we lose that lesson. Any earthly, good, heavenly father should be more interested in his son's character than his son's comfort, his daughter's character than his daughter's comfort. So therefore, we just don't give your children everything they want, all right? Maybe some of you hadn't learned that lesson yet. <laughs> you just don't give them everything they want. There's no, there's no, no understanding uh, of responsibility or, or stewardship or management of their affairs or life. It's, it's not going to be learned that way. I, I love the way when, when Timothy's talking about contentment, and Paul's talking to Timothy about contentment. Well, go back to if you have 1 Timothy 6, 6 there for me. He says, there's great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Amen. Now, what's he saying here? You came in this world with nothing. How many of you that have had children, when they arrived there with you, showed up with a carry-on and one check bag? <laughs> Didn't happen, did it? They didn't even come with instructions, all right? <laughs> They don't show up that way. They come in just naked. They, they got nothing. They don't come in with a year's college tuition. They don't come in with a year's first supply of diaper. You know, there's no coupon. There's nothing. You just got them, all right? They came in with nothing. But he says, now at the other end of that, they're going out with nothing. Now, some of you think you're going out with something. No, you will leave it, all right? You'll leave it in the will or let the government have it, one or the other, all right? <laughs> You're going to leave it. You're, if you buy, you know, the, the funeral home has suits for you. You know, some people wait until they don't ever wear suits. So they, they get the funeral home making arrangements for you. They'll say, well, let's put a suit on him. And you can buy your suit from the funeral home. Yeah. yeah. And that suit has no pockets. Why should it have pockets? Can't put anything in to take it with you. Because you're not taking anything with you. It's the old, you've never seen the U-Haul trailer behind the hearse. Why? Because you're not taking it with you. It may be buried with you, but when you step out of this world, you're going out with nothing. You're going out the same way you came in. So, so one of the best things you can do, learn is this contentment and even greater is godliness. It's the issue of character. It's the issue of your, of your life. Godliness with character, you know. It, it, that's, that's where real contentment is going to come into your life. So Paul's saying, you know, I have learned the secret of contentment. Now, don't misunderstand me here. When I'm saying I'm content, it doesn't mean that I don't have goals in my life or I don't have some, some, some ambitions in my life or, or they don't have some financial goals in my life. All that's well and fine, but it all should be directed, you know, by the Holy Spirit's disciplines in my life and what, what I'm, I'm being led to do and what I know just to be as a wise steward of the things that God's given me. All right. God, God wants to do some things in your life, but contentment means that I don't have to have things to find happiness or to, to experience joy in my life. That contentment is not, it, it, my happiness doesn't become dependent upon what I have in the bank or what I have in my wallet or, or my circumstances. But most people, they don't live their life like that. That's not what we're, what we're geared to in, in this culture. It, we, we have the when and then mentality. When I make more money, then I'll be happy. When I have a better house, I'll be happy. When I drive a better car, then I'll be happy. When this takes place, that will take place. And it never does. You know, there's just, there's just no end, you know. In, in the Proverbs of Job, chapter 1, verse 1, you know what it says? There's no end to the warning of stuff. <laughs> there's, just, there's just no end to it. it. It's always a little more. Someone, someone asked Howard Hughes, you know, how much, Mr. Hughes, is it going to take to make you happy? He said, just a little more. Richest man in the world. 
just a little more. Is that what it's going to take? I mean, when does enough become enough? And when do we realize that God's got a higher and a greater plan for our life? He said, listen, in verse 12, 13, I know how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in prosperity. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled, going hungry, prosperity or not prosperity. Here, what, what's the secret? And by the way, he says he learned it. It's, it's, it is a learning experience. Hopefully it's coming with age. Some of you aren't learning very well, but you should be learning. And he says, what I've learned here, what's, what's the secret? I'll tell you what the secret is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That my happiness is not dependent on my bank account. My happiness isn't dependent on my credit rating. My happiness isn't dependent upon the house, the car, the clothes I wear. The joy, the joy I have doesn't come from outward stuff coming into my life. The joy I have comes from within me. And, and most people don't live with that kind of thing. Most people live with disappointment. Always comparing, always measuring themselves by, by somebody else. That's, that's a really, well, in, in a paraphrased version of what Jesus said, that's a really stupid way to live your life. Jesus says you become fools when you measure yourselves one with another. All right, now that's a little harsher, isn't it? <laughs> you like my version better? It's a stupid way to live your life. Foolishness, he says, to measure yourself by any other standard, by any other person than, than the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, Brother Joe, I just know when I, when I have this amount of money, I make this much more and I get my bills paid off and that paid off and that thing. Care of, then I'm going to be happier. And you're not. And you just continue to, to buy stuff because that's what we're told to do on the TV. Buy this car. Look how people's heads will turn. Wear this perfume. Look at the influence you'll make. Wear these clothes. You dress like this. Hey, then you, you, it, people are going to honor you and respect you and receive you. And on and on and on it goes. And we just, we just... We believe it. I mean, it's like the car salesman said, you know, you deserve this. You deserve this. It's what you deserved. Folks, we got what we deserved. It's not a brand new car. <laughs> Amen. That doesn't fall in that category at all. God has graced our lives. He's blessed us, but we have to be cautious. And God will hold us accountable for how we manage our finances and what we do with the things that he's put at our disposal to use for his glory. And if we mismanage them and don't honor him first and foremost, then we certainly are failing the test. I put a list of the four kinds of spenders that, that, that make up the culture, and this affects the church as well. And every one of us kind of, if, if, we're having, if we're not learning the lesson of contentment, we're going to fall into this category. Don't wait past this point, don't you? I can tell by the look on your face. Don't cover this. We're going to cover it anyway, all right? And these, by the way, are B-A-D spenders. All right, these are bad spenders. There's the, first of all, the, uh, you're going to have to run that for me, the impulsive spender. This person sees a luxury and he thinks, you know, I got to have it. They told him on the TV, he read the magazine article, I got to have this. If I don't have this, I'll not be, I'm just not going to be happy. I, I've got to have this and it's always something else and it's always something more. You just got to have it. If, if, boy, if that's your lifestyle, then you're in big trouble. The second one is the compulsive spender. Now that's the person who, who has a deep, usually unmet need in their life. And they're trying to satisfy that need in their life, trying to fill that void in their life by just buying more stuff. They love to watch the, the, the shopping network. And, and, you know, the shopping network's always got something on it. I, I was watching a little something the other day, and this guy came on, and he had this new thing, and it was just marvelous. You know, and it would do this faster than anybody else. It'd do it better than anybody else. And, and I'm, I'm looking at Kevin saying, you know, we ought to get that. That's stupid. I need that like I need another hole in my head. And that's just being compulsive. We see something and we, we, we just, we, we need to be more cautious. The third kind of, is, is, this is the special interest spender. This is where I, I, I'm, I'm wrestling with. This person does pretty well keeping a budget, but there's this one soft spot, this one area of weakness that they're going to spend money on. Shh, knows how quiet it got on that one. What is it? Well, none of your business. <laughs> But, you know, you're just compelled to spend that money on it. You don't need it. It's just, it's just that thing. It, and who knows what that thing is, but it's your soft spot. And whenever it happens, you know, you just, oh, I've got to have that. That's what I need. And then you'll spend the money on that. Now, there's nothing wrong with spending money on something as long as you have, the, first of all, the money to spend it, and two, the permission from the Lord to spend it. And following that's permission from your wife. It helps too, all right? <laughs> I remember one thing I bought that I just had to have. It was one of those impulsive things, and I bought it. 
you know, at least the bank helped me buy it. And they bought it. <laughs> I signed for it. And I drove it to the house. Y'all know that look from your wife you get? What is that? And what do you need that for? Well, I drove it back to the dealership the next morning. <laughs> gave it back to him, tore up the document and didn't keep it. She was right though. It was stupid. I needed, I didn't need that. I, you know, it was just something I wanted. And I just thought, I'm just, the opportunity's here. I can do it. I've got the credit rating. I, I, can, I can do that. So I did it. And I, I got to think, you know, I'll have this for about two days and I'll see 44 more of them around the neighborhood and I won't want it anymore. I thought it was unique. I thought it was special. Here it is, you buy that car, you know, and you picked out the one nobody had one like. And then you got in it and drove it off a lot and everybody had one. <laughs> you ever notice that before? Everybody's got this car. I thought I was going to be unique. Everybody's driving it in the same color. <laughs> one of those deals. Unless you bought a real ugly car, which is something, no comment. Anyway, the special interest. Man. The, third, the fourth one is the status seeker spender. They just really only buy things to impress other people. You know, this will make a mark. This, this will let people know I'm a, I'm a man of distinction or whatever else it might be. And, and you buy it to make your mark. And well, you left a mark, but it's a big red mark in your checkbook. And you're in trouble once again. We, we really do need to follow Paul's example here when he says we need to learn the lesson, this secret, he calls it, of contentment. The secret. First of all, how do you learn contentment? Well, you stop doing what causes discontentment, like comparing, you know, like bad spending habits, you know. The, the things that you can't walk around comparing your shoes with everybody else's shoes, your house with everybody else's house, your car with everybody else's car, you know, whatever it is. If you end up living your life that way, you know, it, it becomes just stupidity, foolishness, like Jesus said, and you're just wasting Wasting some very good resources that God has put in your life. We have to get to the place that I think where God trusts us with, with things and God can trust us with things, I believe, when we learn this lesson of contentment. If I can't learn this lesson of contentment, then certainly I don't know what I can be trusted with. The third lesson. The third lesson is the lesson of contribution. And there's a lot in this lesson that we can't cover today, but we'll get, we'll get a little start on it, all right? This lesson of contribution, he said, you know, uh, you, you, you gave to me. When nobody else did, you shared in my affliction. You know, uh, you Philippians, you were the first one at the preaching of the gospel that you reached out and, and no other church shared with me in this matter, but you, and you, you're giving. Alone. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you continued to meet the need there, you know, and, and, and more than just once, you sent it to me my needs. Now, I don't seek a gift for myself. He said, I, I really wasn't asking, but you showed your compassion. I don't seek a profit, you know. If there's any profit I'm seeking, I want it to increase to your account. Now, how does that work? Because when you give, it will increase to your account. I know it's illogical. It doesn't make sense in the context of the world's thinking, but it's a biblical principle we'll talk about in a moment. I want it to increase your account. I, I have an abundance. I'm amply supplied. What you sent by Aphrodite was such a blessing. He went on to say, you sent, it's like a fragrant aroma. It's, it's an acceptable sacrifice and it's well pleasing to God. I believe we often lose that context of what that is, what our gifts really are, that they are a sweet aroma, that they are a sacrifice that's pleasing unto God. And we forget that, that all those terms that he just used, those are terms of worship. All right. This aroma, this, this, this satisfying, pleasing aroma to God, this acceptable gift. Those are things that can contain around the whole concept of what worship is. Romans 12, 1, present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. He goes on, talks in 2 Corinthians about being an aroma that smells sweet unto God. Those are all Old Testament illustrations from the act of worship of the priest as they're placing the offerings upon the altar and being committed that God is blessed and God receives those things and God is honored and they glorify God. He's saying your gift brought glory and honor and was, was a genuine act of worship. How often have we lost that mindset? That when I give, when I tithe, when I, when I go beyond tithe, when I'm giving, it is an acceptable, pleasing offering, an act of worship to the Lord. And that's what he's sharing. And then he highlights it with this, this verse that just this compounds the whole thing. And in verse 19 says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in by Christ Jesus. And again, that is a promise which a lot of people claim. First of all, he says, my God. Now you can kind of circle the word my because this is a personal commitment that God is making, all right? And he, God doesn't promise to meet everybody's needs. You hear that? 
He doesn't promise to meet everybody. He promises to meet your needs if you're one of his children. My God, it's a personal relationship. My God, and then he goes on to say the second part of this, my God will. You can circle the word will. It doesn't say my God might meet your needs, does it? But he says my God will meet your needs. In fact, when God makes a promise like that, he's staking his reputation. His little, his very character says, so I will meet your needs. The third thing says, God will meet all. You know, look at that. God will meet all your needs. It doesn't say God will meet some of your needs. God will meet all your needs. Does that include my car payments? Is there a need? My home, my groceries. God is going to meet my needs. Yes, it's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean God's going to meet all your greeds. God's going to meet all your wants. And you can circle the word needs. It says, I will meet all your needs. Just like we said a while ago, a parent's not going to give a child everything he wants. He's going to give him what he needs. God says, I will meet all your needs. You say, well, Brother Joe, I read the scripture. I memorize the scripture. I have it written out on a piece of paper. It's on my refrigerator. I believe it with all my heart. But how come I have all these financial needs? Good question, legitimate question, because here's his promise. Here's what we have to understand. When you see all these beautiful promises, and they are beautiful, the Bible says they're exceeding abundantly precious promises from God. When we see those promises of God, you need to understand that every promise of God has a premise. It's not just a promise standing on, there's a premise in which that promise has been stated. And Paul just laid out the premise for the promise. He said, because you gave and you've continued to give and you have shared in this need, my God will supply all your need. I mean, isn't that the context here? Isn't that the premise of what he's saying? For me just to stand up and say, well, God's going to meet all my needs according to riches and glory and then not respond to the premise of scripture in which that promise was given to us is foolishness. But people do that all the time. They pull out some little scripture and say, that's my promise, but they ignore the premise of that promise. I I'm praying for revival in the country. God's in revival. But you're not obeying the premise of the promise where it says, you know, God says, you know, if my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and fast and pray, turn from the wicked ways, I'll send revival. No, we just want revival. We don't want to turn from our wicked ways. And certainly we don't want to fast. There's Burger King right across the street. So, you know, we, we, want a, we want a promise based on our premise and it just doesn't work that way. And there's a lot of financial promises, but there's also a lot of financial premise that it's attached to those principles in the word of God. There's principles about giving, there's principles about saving, there's principles about investing, there's principles about spending. There's principles about how you use your resources. So Paul gets into this, this important lesson of the lesson of contribution. And it's this, the lesson of contribution is, is it really gets down to is understanding this whole premise promise thing. It's understanding the law of the harvest. Now we've talked about this in past sermons and there's three elements to the law of the harvest. The first of all, you know, is you reap what you sow, right? You reap what you sow. Every farmer knows this lesson. A farmer doesn't go out and look at his fields when it comes time for harvest and say, oh man, what happened? There's nothing coming up. There's no fruit. There's no produce. There's no harvest. Not when he's got four bags of seed still in the barn. You know, if, if you got four bags of seed in the barn, you have to plant the seed before you can expect the harvest. Paul ta talks about that in, in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. That, that, you know, the farmer goes out with an expectation because he gave the seed into the ground and there's this expectation that it's going to produce something. And he's saying, listen, when we give, there should be an expectation. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. I had one guy tell me one time, well, I just think that's, that's, that's arrogance, you know, to expect anything. Well, if it, God hadn't said it, it would be arrogance. But God gives the idea of, of, of an expectation. In fact, God's the one in Malachi who says, hey, why don't you try me out on this deal? Why, why don't you test me out here and see if I will not open the windows of heaven? See if I will not rebuke the devourer. See if I, I'll not overflow your barns. I mean, this God says that. It's not the preacher or the evangelist. This is the Lord God who, who makes that declaration and challenges us to say, try me out on this deal. The only place in scripture where God says, test him. Test me out on this deal. See if I will not meet the need. See if I won't come through and take care of the situation. He's laid out these principles though. The first principle is you reap what you sow. And then the second one is you reap later than you sow. 
All right. It may come up today. It may come up next year. It may come up in, in, in whatever it is. But the Bible says when it's due season, in due season, you will reap if you faint not. In due season, whatever that due season is, that's in God's hands. I'm just going to trust him that he's going to meet the need because I am doing as he's told me to do. You reap what you sow. You reap later than you sow. The third point of this is you reap more than you sow. That's a praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, that's a pretty good little promise right there. I'm going to get more back than what I gave. Any investor likes that idea. You hate to give and not get something for it. People do that all the time too. Isn't that right? They give and they invest and they never get anything back from it because they're basing on the premises of the promise. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this. Now, if the Lord says remember this, then it's a good idea to memorize that part. <laughs> right. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly. Somebody answer that, would you? Not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now catch this. He says, each one of you, that's everybody here, should make a decision in your heart about what? Well, to give, be a cheerful giver. Beyond that, back to the context of it. Context of it, how do you want to receive it? How do you want to get back? You want to get a little bit back? Then give a little bit. You, know, you get a little bit more than what you gave. You want to give a lot back? Give a lot. How do you want to get it back? You sat in your heart, make a decision. But when you give it, whether you give a lot or whether you give a little, do it with a heart that's glad and rejoicing and be a cheerful giver. The promise is pretty simple here. The, the promise is, is, a, is, a, is a law within the whole context of the universe. It applies to every area of your life, whatsoever you sow, you'll reap from. I've had people say, oh, Brother Joe, I don't have any friends. And, and I understand why they don't have any friends. They're usually a wallflower. They don't talk to anybody. They'll say, I'm just shy. And, and, and listen, you can't be shy and be a Christian. I hate to tell you that. You say, why not? Because the Bible says God made you salt and light. That, that means you're obvious. There's something about, something about the absence of salt, all right? I, I, if it doesn't taste right, I'm putting a little water on it. And it makes a, it makes a radical difference, does it not? Right. It makes a difference. Guess what? You're salt. You're supposed to make a radical difference. When the room is dark and the light comes on, it's very obvious, is it not? So there's something about just being called to live for Jesus that says, you can't be a wallflower anymore. It hasn't got anything to do with your personality. It has now to do with your spirituality. Will you just be out there where you make a difference for the kingdom of God. Well, Brother Joe, I'm just not, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs, if you want friends, you must show yourself what? Friendly. So if you ain't got any friends, because you're not friendly. <laughs> You'll get over it. Talk to me later. We can counsel on this. <laughs> we can pray more about it. Well, Brother Joe, all this, people just criticize me all the time. Well, quit being such a critic. People gossip about me. Quit gossiping about them. People don't love me. We'll start loving them. Because you will reap whatever you sow. It just, it's just down every area of your life. You know what the doctor did? You say, doctor, I'm just tired. I'm sluggish. I don't have any energy. You know what he'll probably recommend? After checking you out and everything's okay, I'll say, you need to get to the gym start working out. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I'll wear myself out in the gym. Yeah, but you're going to wake up with a lot more energy. Later, you're going to have a lot more energy from it. It's just, it's just the part of the law of, of what God's got going on in the, in the whole cosmos. But you, you can't sit there with a scowl on your face in life. You have to learn to approach it with grace and with, with dignity and, 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 and go for God's gusto for your life. And the goals it is, you know, some of the people I know are just gripey and, you know, just, you know, just, they're like lemon juice being around. You just want to pucker up, you know, you know, don't get that on me, whatever it is. You like that guy when the missionary came to the church and was sharing about the foreign mission field and all the needs that was there and the church was taking an offering for him. The ushers were walking up and down the aisles and passing out the plate and he stops at one row and obviously there was this guy who did not want to be there. And maybe his wife made him come, I don't know. He's sitting there with a big scowl on his face and his arms crossed and the usher kind of holds the plate out in front of him and, you know, and the guy just, just kind of grumbled at him you know, like he didn't want to do anything. Of course, he did want him to pass it on, but he wouldn't even do that. You know, so he holds the plate out in front of him, and the guy just shakes his head. So the usher leans over and said, well, sir, it's for missions. It's for missions. He responded, I don't believe in him. Now, the usher was pretty sharp because at this point, he, stern, he leans down to the man and says, hey, then you just take some out for yourself. It's for the heathen anyway. <laughs> so, maybe that's something you need to do this morning. 
Let's go into the mission field. Maybe you are the mission field. You know, there's so many people when you preach about these kind of things and talk about these things, even in the flow of the context of scripture, they get upset. They get upset. They, they haven't learned this simple principle. You reap what you sow, you reap more you sow. Look at Luke 6, 38. Jesus said, give and it will be given unto you. And the measure you use to give out, that measure which God uses to give it back to you, the same measure. You know, what did he just say before when we talked about Paul says, you know, the measure you give it. How you give it out is the way you will get it back. Look in verse in, in 2 Corinthians where he says, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all your needs, you'll abound to every good work. You know, if you click that a couple of times, I don't know if you'd be able to, but there's underlines on those things. God is able. Anybody believe that? Amen. God is able to make all grace abound to you. What does that mean? That God has the capacity to move in a supernatural way and a spiritual way to make sure that your needs are met. That God is God and he can do that. He can make all grace abound. Why? So that, that in all things, in all things, all things that are real legitimate needs in your life, God will meet those. In all things, in all places, at all times. You know, there's, there's no out verse here. If, as long as you're responding to the Holy Spirit, that he will meet the need in your life and you will abound in every good work. It was it Bill Stafford wrote in his book, uh, the Living Giving Abundantly. He, he says that the, the explanation for that about abounding in every good work is that God wants to meet your needs so that you have enough for your needs to be met and enough left over to give away, to abound, to keep planting the seed, to keep expecting the harvest. This is where a lot of people just miss it. They believe these passages of scriptures, but let me show you an Old Testament principle found in Proverbs 3. It says this, honor the Lord from your wealth. And from the first fruit, the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, what is that all about? That's all about everything from Genesis chapter one to the end of the book. God has this simple principle of reaping and sowing that if I will obey it, and I will understand it, and I will live in the premise of that promise that God said, all needs, all times, abounding with enough left over to minister to other people's needs. That's the promise of God. He said, Brother Joe, that's not my life. Then you need to discover where, where you off track at. It will probably be in this very first important first step. We call it tithing. We don't like that word. Some of y'all think that's a cuss word. Well, that's Old Testament. Like the Old Testament's not the Bible. <laughs> Last time I checked, it was part of the Holy Bible. Old and new. And everything in the old is obviously a shadow, a forefigure, a type of what the new's all about. So if we have in the Old Testament a type of what our New Testament giving is all about, then it starts with at least 10%. Now you say, well, that's, old, that's the law. No, no. You read your Bible, you'll see that was instituted before the law. In fact, in fact, Adam and Eve must have taught it to Cain and Abel because we see them in Genesis making offerings to the Lord. And there was a dispute over the offering, how, why one was received and one was not received. I don't believe the dispute was over the issue of blood offering versus a grain offering because the Old Testament says that grain offerings were acceptable. Even here he says, bring the first part of your grain offerings and your fruit offerings, right? I believe it was over the issue of doing the right thing in the right way in the right amount, at least a portion of, the, of a first fruits offering. One gave a first fruits offering, one doesn't. You know, what's it mean to give a first fruits offering? It means that's the first thing that comes out of your paycheck. You don't say, well, Roger, I've got automatic withdrawal in my bank and tithe is not one of them. I pay my light bill that way, I pay my car bill that way, I pay my utilities that way, I pay, and, and the bank just writes all these checks for you and sends them out. Well, the first one on the list ought to be church. It ought to be church. That's first fruits, all right? Now we don't go out with multiple harvesting, all right? And give a portion of the very first offering that comes in, but we do know that the first part of what we do receive, the context of the principle is that, that the first part of what I receive, if I get paid weekly, then Sunday morning, whatever I got paid on Friday, I give the first portion of that to the Lord. Before I make a car payment, before I pay the bank, before I pay my mortgage, before I pay anything else, God gets what he gets. Why? Because that's a biblical principle. When Kathy and I got married, we were poor as church mice, all right? In fact, we lived with the church mice. 
They were friends. <laughs> but one thing we decided we would do in the very beginning, you know, the first part of what we get, we're going to give to God. It's not going to come after we pay the other bills to see if there's anything left because there won't be anything left. All right. You always have, you know, if you, if you live your life that way, it's a backwards way to live your life and you can't expect much from it. I'm going to give to God once I get paid the first 15. Then on the, the first Sunday after whatever my payday is, that's the Sunday I'm going to sit down and give God 10%. Now, I said, well, Joe, that's a lot of money. I make a lot of money. It's a dime on a dollar. Some of you throw dimes away. Some of you drop a dime in the parking lot. You won't even pick it up. Not important. Doesn't register with you until it comes to your tithe. Then every dime's important. A dime. If I make a dollar this week, how much do I give? How much? Say it like this. A dime. <laughs> Just a dime. It's, it's a little dime. It's just 10 cents. How much do I keep? I like 90. 90 is good. 90 is, that's like nine dimes. <laughs> Amen. 90. 10 cents. 90 for me. 10 cents for God. I'm starting to feel bad about it talking like this. Maybe I need to give God more than 10 cents on every dollar. Well, 10 cents is a great place to start. Young or old, working, retired, 10 cents a time. I mean, can I make that even clear? You tight wad? A dime on a dollar. You're keeping 90 cents. But what else am I getting? I'm getting a lot more than my 90 cents. If I give sparingly, and that's sparingly giving, I believe. That's starting place. That's sparingly giving. It's a dime <laughs> on a dollar. <laughs> well, if you just do that, God says, listen, I'll make sure your barns are filled. I'll make sure your barns are filled. Say, brother, I can't even afford a barn. Give your dime. <laughs> oh, every dollar. <laughs> Amen. And you'll have to build a barn. You'll have money to build the barn, by the way. What if I make a thousand dollars? It's a hundred bucks. I get 900. Is it, just do the math. It's pretty simple, all right? God knew we weren't gonna be math majors, all of us. 10% is pretty easy. But understand, it's not charity. You're not saying, well, I'm doing my charitable contribution. Not, this is worship. You know, this is, this is the heart of worship. All those terminology in New Testament where it talks about your offerings, your, your physical monetary offerings, they're always tied to what worship words are giving and sacrifice and acceptable and well-pleasing. They're always tied to stuff like that because it is an act of worship. We don't pass a plate here. You know, we have these offering receptacles. You come in and you ought to be putting your check or whatever in there. If you do it that way, some of you give it through PayPal, some are doing it through the bank, whatever. but you always do it. When you do it, however you do it, say, this is my act of worship for God this week. This is my way of telling God, thank you for everything you're giving me. This is my way of honoring you. No, I couldn't, the Bible says, Father, you tell me it's, it's, if without you, I wouldn't have the power to make wealth to start with. You know? And the Bible tells me, Father, that you love a cheerful giver. In other words, I'm going to put my money where my, where my heart is. Where, for where it's treasure, that's where his heart is. So listen, it's no problem because my treasure is you. My heart belongs to you. My life belongs to you. And when you do that, when you start moving that way, then you begin to discover what genuine act of worship really is. I mean, over and over the scriptures, let me put it in kind of a, 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 a common English language for you as possible. God just says, you put me first in every area of your life. You put me first in your financial life. Just watch what I'll do for you. I will bless you to a point you'll overflow and you'll be able to be a blessing to others. That's the way it works. Give and it will be given unto you. Give it and be given to you, a portion first portion. And when I do my part, God blesses me and God honors me. So why? So I can continue to do even more. I, I know that there's some of these rooms that right now, Brother Joe, you just don't know my situation and I cannot afford it. You can live your life and you'll live the rest of your life that way. I'll tell you right now. You'll never be able to afford it. Even if you're making lots of money, you'll just think, I can't afford it yet. You won't ever be able to afford it because this is an act of faith 
and heart and worship. He says, I'm going to do this because I really do care. And I love God. And God's made these promises to me. And the premise of those promises is what I'm doing and how I'm doing what I'm doing. And this, and, and this is the way Paul finishes this letter, basically. You know, he's wrapping it up here saying, you're being blessed because you are a blessing. And he, write, he just starts to have the first letter, how much of a blessing they've been. Doesn't he? he just goes, it's just overflowing. Well, what a blessing they are. Don't you want that written about your life? I don't think anybody wants to have a tombstone that reads, here lies stingy. <laughs> Died to tightwad. You know? Nobody wants that. And nobody's ever remembered or honored for what they didn't give. <laughs> They're always honored and remembered for what they gave and were they a given person. Be that kind of man, that kind of woman, that kind of young person. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I thank you.